This is a story about a man named Elijah. Elijah was feeling discouraged that the Israelites didn't want to follow God and wanted to worship a fake God instead. So he ran away. Elijah walked for 40 days and nights till he came to a mountain called Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. There, Elijah went into a cave and hid there all night. Elijah, why are you here? asked God. I've worked hard for you, Elijah responded, but your people have broken their agreement with you. They have destroyed all the places to worship you in and killed all the prophets that spoke about you. I'm the only prophet left and now they want to kill me too. Stand outside the cave and I, the Lord God, will pass by. Just as he said this, a very strong wind blew. It caused mountains to break apart all around him. But the Lord was not in the wind. Then an earthquake came and shook the mountain. But God was not in the earthquake. After that came fire. Big flames of fire passed by. But God was not in the fire. After the fire, there was a quiet, gentle voice. When Elijah heard it, he covered his face with his coat and went out and stood at the entrance to the cave. Now tell me, Elijah, the quiet voice said, what are you doing here? I have faithfully served you, Elijah answered again. But the people of Israel don't want to worship you. I'm the only prophet left and they want to kill me. Go back through the wilderness, God instructed. There you will find a man named Elisha. Anoint him with oil, for he will be my next prophet after you. And know that you are not alone, God continued. 7,000 people have refused to worship any other false gods. So Elijah left and did all that God had asked him. Amen. Thanks so much, Rosanna. And welcome again, everyone. Um, last week, we saw how Elijah kind of ends up in that cave, how he spirals into a pit of despair from kind of mountaintop high to desert low. And it begs the question, doesn't it? How does someone with so much faith and anointing end up in this place of desperation? You know, Elijah, he's, you think about it, he's faced down the highest powers in the land, and yet he ends up running away in fear, abandoning his calling and wanting to quit and die. Uh, this is a really serious breakdown. And um, he says in, in verse 10, basically, everything's gone wrong. Jezebel, you know, wants to kill me. There's been no national revival, no return to God. And he's scared. Uh, Elijah's hurting here. These are really raw, kind of honest words that kind of reveal major disappointment. Firstly, he's disappointed with God. You know, he, he says, verse 10, that I've been very zealous for the Lord. It's like, God, I've done my part. You know, why haven't you done your part, God? God, why, why haven't things worked out? You know, I've been devoted. Where are you, God? Devo really disappointed with God. But he's also, secondly, he's disappointed with God's people. He describes them as the Israelites that have rejected your covenant. He's like, I'm the only one left. He, he feels abandoned, unsupported and alone. This is a real kind of make or break time for his faith. And it is so important for us um, because Elijah's experience is actually very often our experience. You know, today we're celebrating baptism and, and walking with God and it's, it's wonderful. But we do need to know that there are also difficult days that come. You know, pain that might leave us kind of desperately disappointed with God or his people. 
And it can hurt so much that we can actually feel like running away and quitting. I wonder if you've ever felt like that. You know, Oratilli shared earlier of her own deep pain and the struggle that brought to her relationship with God. Have you ever felt like that? You know, I know I have. You know, times when I've just not been able to understand what God is doing. Or, or, or times when those I thought would support me have instead kind of walked away and I've just wanted to quit. And some people do. You know, even Elijah does his best to reject God's calling. He wants to check out of life and ministry. Maybe some of you feel like that today, a bit like that picture. You know, Elijah doesn't know what to do with his pain. So he actually travels six weeks journey away from Israel to a very special place to Mount Sinai, the place where God met with Moses and his people. Perhaps he's kind of hoping for some kind of fresh revelation, hoping God will show up. And if you feel like that today, you're, you're trying to deal with pain or disappointment. You know, I've got some encouragement for us because God does show up for Elijah. God loves to show up for his people. See, though Elijah wants to quit, God has not finished with Elijah. And guess what? God has not finished with you and with me. You know, this morning, we're going to explore how Elijah emerges from despair and how his life and calling are restored. And I believe God wants to be doing that for some of us today. How does that happen? Well, firstly, Elijah has to remember who this is all about. It's about God, not you. You know, what is going on in Elijah's heart at this time? Well, God actually knows what's going on. But the problem is Elijah doesn't. You know, one of the biggest challenges with dealing with pain is often we don't really understand kind of what's going on here. You know, Jeremiah 79 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. And then he asks, who can understand it? It's like, who can make sense of what's going on here? You know, our culture's narrative of just follow your heart, make decisions on how you feel. It sounds great, but it's really not very helpful because we don't understand half the time what is going on in our hearts. In fact, at his lowest point, as we saw last week, Elijah isn't in any shape to understand anything. He just needs food and rest and the touch of God. And God is so kind. Let's show that same kindness to one another. But six weeks later, God needs to help Elijah see some things. And again, he's very gracious. He, he doesn't tell him off of kind of abandoning his place and running away. He, he simply asks him a question. Verse nine, he says, what are you doing here? It, it's an invitation for Elijah to pour out his heart, to be honest with how he's feeling. Do you know, it's so important we do that with God. Maybe you need to do that at the moment to be real. Uh, Elijah's answer reveals a very confused heart. There's a whole ton of disappointment, some of which is true, but much of which isn't. Do you know, when we're hurting, it's very difficult to see things clearly. You know, things can look far worse than they actually are. We lose perspective. You know, in his commentary, Jeff Lucas writes, never make a significant decision about your life when you're meandering around in the fog of self-pity. And that's one of the most striking things about Elijah's reply is how centered on himself it is. He says, I've been very zealous, verse 10. I'm the only one left. They're trying to kill me. Elijah seems to be saying it's all hopeless. He's completely forgotten about people like Obadiah, let alone God. And one of the really hard things about pain, even about, you know, depression, is this sense of hopelessness that can come. And the danger of seeing everything kind of through this lens of self, blaming others, blaming yourself, our, our focus can shift from kind of upwards and outwards to inwards. And it's not surprising really that happens because when you're in pain, often all you can think about is the pain, but it's very unhelpful. What's gone wrong here with Elijah? 
Well, Elijah's made a really common mistake. He thinks that the success of his ministry and his life rests on him rather than God. And the burden of that kind of pressure on him has crushed him. But this was never supposed to be just about Elijah. It was supposed to be about God's power kind of working through him. You know, when we seek to live in our own strength, it, it leads to burnout because we take on ourselves a burden that's impossible to carry. I saw this picture this week and thought, yes, Do you know, sometimes life can be like that. It's like we're just tipped up. We can't carry it. I actually feel like that now. And we can do that in all kinds of ways. At work, you can try to be the hero who always works late. You can do that in ministry, always having to give more. You can do that as a parent, kind of determined that your child would succeed at any cost. And you pile on the pressure on yourself upon others. And eventually, the breakdown comes, the disappointment comes, the bitterness comes, because it's not a story about God. It's a story about you. And we always fail. So how does God respond? Well, again, he doesn't tell Elijah off. Instead, he deals with him in grace because it's actually always been about grace. God says, verse 11, the Lord said, go and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord for the Lord is about to pass by. The way you get perspective is by experience the presence of God afresh. Elijah needs to know that God is there, that God is real, that God is near. And that's actually God's promise. James 4 verse 8 says, if you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. So he's told, go stand on the mountain, verse 11. And Elijah seems a bit reluctant because he actually stays in the cave while the lightning comes and the earthquake comes and the fire comes. But we read, God was not in those things. And then verse 12 comes the quiet whisper. This is what Elijah needs. You know, we often only expect God in the, the big things, you know, the summer worship camp, you know, the big church, you know, not in our living room, not our bedroom, not in a cave on your own, not right now. But that's often where God is speaking the things we need to hear most in that quiet whisper. Jeff Lucas again says, God is just as much in the sound that can barely be heard as anywhere else. God speaks, verse 13, and says, where, what are you doing here, Elijah? <laughs> Why does God ask him the same question? Well, it's probably because Elijah hasn't understood it yet. You notice God includes Elijah's name in the question. Do you remember what his name means? It means Yahweh is the real God. So God is saying here, what are you doing here, Elijah? Is Yahweh the real God? That's the same question that Elijah asked of the people. It's who are you trusting? Have you forgotten who the real God is? Do you really believe Jezebel has more authority than me? And Elijah found himself in the very place he was calling the people out of, failing to trust God, losing sight of the one with real authority, allowing fear to take control. I wonder, is that you? Is that me today? Not really trusting, fear reigning, pain, disappointment, dominating. Maybe you're not sure what's kind of going on in your heart, but you know you want to get away. You know, God invites you to come and hear his voice afresh. This time of COVID might actually be the perfect opportunity for that. You know, to even plan some time in these coming days to find some space, to get out your Bible, to get out your notebook, to sit still before God and say, come and speak to me, to regain perspective. But that's not all you need to get out of these times. You need to remember who it's about, but secondly, remember what it's about. It's about God's plans not ours. How does Elijah respond the second time? Verse 14, he replies with exactly the same answer. He just kind of trots it out. It's like he's been rehearsing this speech for the past six weeks, maybe longer, rehearsing his pain, distilling the accusation. It's a really common thing to do. Do you know, it's really worth listening to ourselves carefully sometimes 
to, to watch for the language of me, myself, and I. You know, we can see it in Elijah here, but Elijah can't. He doesn't understand his heart. And this is the problem with pain. You're normally the last person to understand what's going on. That's why you usually can't just talk someone out of that place of pain. And so God doesn't just ask a question. God gives an instruction and a revelation. And the instruction is probably not what Elijah wants to hear. Look, verse 15, the Lord said to him, go back the way you came. God says, Elijah, you need to return to the calling on your life. I've got some things for you to do. I've got some people for you to help. You know, one of the best things you can actually do when you're in pain is to seek to help someone else. You know, are there people around you at the moment who need your help? God says to Elijah, there's a plan still to unfold. And, and this is the clue to understanding Elijah's pain. He is devastated because his plans have gone wrong. You know, our biggest disappointments often come because our plans fail. What Elijah missed was that God's plans haven't failed. You know, when our plans fail, remember God's plans haven't. In fact, what God calls Elijah to do reveals plans that are bigger than Elijah had imagined. God calls Elijah to anoint an enemy king who will bring judgment, to anoint a new king for Israel who'll bring revival, to anoint another prophet who'll be the one who sees all those things happen. God is not finished. God has been doing so much more than Elijah has realized, including verse 18, reserving this 7,000 people. It was never just about Elijah and his plans. It was about God and his bigger plan, bigger than Elijah could imagine, because he's called to pave the way, not just for this new king, Jehu, of verse 17, but for the ultimate king, Jesus. You know, we're told in Malachi 4, verse 5, that Elijah will return to proclaim this king. And that's exactly what happens. Hundreds of years later, a strange man kind of appears called John the Baptist saying, a new king is coming whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He will finally bring the change and transformation that you long for. And Jesus says, Matthew 17, verse 12, this is Elijah returned as God promised, announcing Jesus' arrival. And then the real king comes. Jesus comes onto the scene. You know, Jesus comes because there was no way we could sort ourselves out. It's about God, not us. It's about what only God can do, not what we can do. And we see in Jesus the true cost of moving towards people in love. A costly, mysterious plan that looked like failure to the disciples. Jesus dead on a cross, all gone wrong. But the plan was better. The plan was resurrection. The plan was the defeat of death and the forgiveness of sins, which is what we're celebrating in baptism today. You know, Jesus giving his life for our life, taking our failure and judgment on himself, inviting us to join him in bringing new life to others. Do you have pain today? Disappointment with God or with his people? He tempted to give up. Perhaps you need to move towards God again. Perhaps there's people, some of his people that you need to move towards again. Come to Jesus. Seek his presence. Come and hear his still, small voice that says, I love you. Come and trust in the amazing plan of God. Yes, it involves a cross. There is pain in the journey, but there is not just a cross. There is an empty tomb. This is the path to new resurrection life for you and for those that you dare to love through God's power. Let's pray together. We're just going to invite God to come and uh, Jamie and the band are going to lead us in a moment. 
But I, I want to invite you just to hold your hands open to God. You, you might want to stand if you're able, but to, to do that is as if to say, God, I, I want to draw near. I want to hear your voice again. Ask God to speak. Ask God to heal. Ask God to perhaps restore your calling. Even as we sing this song together. Come, Lord Jesus.